In this video, what we're going to do is run through an example on determining the um, uh, bending capacity of a steel member um, subjected to a particular load based upon the provisions which are in NZS 3404, which is the uh, steel standard in New Zealand. So it's uh, this one here. Um, and we're going to use the uh, what we've learned in the last a uh, few lectures around, you know, how do we determine section capacity, how do we determine uh, member capacity, and sort of put it together in, uh, in, in a design example. So uh, for the brief that we have here on, on, the, on this uh, example, uh, we need to determine a suitable UB. So a UB is just a, a universal beam, um, and they look like this, so they're uh, an I-shaped section. And, um, you know, with the difference between a UB and a UC, uh, they're both I shapes, uh, but you can see the UC tends to be uh, about as wide as it is deep, uh, while a UB uh, is substantially deeper, and that's why they tend to get used for beams instead of uh, uh, more for columns. Um, and then we're, it's uh, a grade 300 steel, so that's going to be a 300 megapascal yield stress. Um, and then uh, what we have down here, so it's a 12 meter long beam, it's simply supported, and it has uh, three different restraints. It's got a restraint uh, at each end, uh, which um, effectively prevents tw both twist and lateral movement, and uh, it has a, uh, we'll say, uh, we'll do this one here, we'll say and twist uh, for this one here. Uh, in the middle. Um, we have some load which is applied. Uh, the, lo the load is um, going to be some, some uh, permanent load, some dead load of uh, 400 kilonewtons and some um, imposed load or you know sometimes called live load uh, of 50 kilonewtons and that's uh, at the top flange uh, right at mid-span. So uh, jumping into this, uh, you know, first things that we always need to do when we're uh, so I, I guess to maybe take a step back, uh, essentially what we need to do is determine, you know, what our uh, moment demand is uh, and our maximum moment demand on the section um, and, and the, the member in general. Um, one, and then determine sort of, you know, pick a, a, a UB which has uh, a large enough section to resist that demand. Uh, and then we need to check and make sure that the, the segment uh, between points of restraint uh, isn't going to undergo lateral torsional buckling uh, before we reach that section capacity. So that's that's the overview of, of what we're going to do, and we're going to step through those um, bits and pieces right now. Um, so before we start, you know, I've got my calc sheet uh, here. I always like to, in my right-hand margin, uh, just use this as a, um, a, a reference column. So with references, I can either put in uh, code equations, um, just so that, you know, I know where those are coming from uh, when I go back and, and, you know, perhaps review my uh, calculations at a later date, um, or uh, another engineer knows, um, you know, how, how I came up with uh, a particular equation or numbers. Uh, also, I, I'll use this if I'm, if I have a large calculation package and I might be referring back to uh, you know, uh, a previous page. I can, I can use that as the reference. So you'll see as I go through, I'll have a reference here and I'll also be writing down uh, particular code equations. So um, first thing we need to do, just like I said, is we need to find out what our demands are on the section. Um, so we, we've been given some uh, permanent load and some imposed load and we need to, to factor those together. And, and so we do that through a, a number of load combinations. So for just, um, you know, gravity, uh, so we'll do load, uh, not combos, combos, sorry. So our load combinations uh, for just gravity are just going to be 1.35 times the permanent load. So that's going to be, we'll call that load combo 1. Load combo 2 is 1.2 times our permanent load plus 1.5 times our imposed load. 
And I'll just put a little note here, uh, number three, we're going to ignore our snow, wind, and earthquake load because, well, you know, frankly, they're not given in the design brief. This is a, you can think of this beam as a, essentially a, uh, a gravity only uh, design case. So if we, um, if we work out what some of these values are, uh, we're going to say that's going to equal 1.35 times our permanent load 0.40 kilonewtons, and that's going to equal uh, 54 kilonewtons. And then our other load combination is uh, 1.2 times our uh, permanent load plus 1.5 times our imposed load and that equals uh, 123 kilonewtons. Uh, the 123 is a, is a larger load than the 54, so this one uh, governs. So uh, because that's the one that uh, governs here, let me just clean up that K uh, so it looks a little bit uh, clearer on screen. Uh, because that's what, you know, our, our largest load combination is, this is what we need to design our member for. Um, so uh, now that we know sort of, you know, this point load P uh, is this combination here. So P equals 123 kilonewtons. Well, uh, now we need to sort of determine, well, what, what bending moment demand does this P um, create. So the always the thing we want to do is we want to, um, whenever we start an, a problem like this, is uh, draw a free body diagram. So we'll do that. Uh, we've got a load P coming there. Uh, actually, instead of drawing the supports, I'll just draw the reactions. And that's six meters. Six meters. That's 123 kilonewtons. Because it's nice and symmetric, um, we know that we have, uh, you know, the same force at each reaction. So, fairly straightforward statics there, 61.5. I'll just call this the FBD for free body diagram. Um, I'll also, just while I'm here, I'll put a, a little X everywhere where I have a restraint. X equals restraint. And um, that, what that restraint's doing, you know, this is, you know, where we, we have both, um, you know, we're, we're stopping either lateral uh, movement or twist or both. So um, this is what our, our free body diagram looks like. So let's look at what the shear demand is. We won't go over shear uh, design in this example, um, but uh, since we're here, it's a relatively easy demand to work out. And I'm just saying positive is, you know, we have an arrow going up on the left, down on the right, and vice versa. Um, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, let me just, let me tidy up my drawing here just a little bit, just so it doesn't, uh, it's, it's a symmetric loading, let's draw it symmetrically. So if you just bear with me here for a second. Uh, 61.5. It just uh, it makes everything look a little bit nicer. All right, so that's 61.5 kilonewtons in shear. Five kilonewtons, and that means that V star, our shear demand equals 61.5 kilonewtons. All right, that's fairly straightforward. Uh, let's look at what our moment demand is on the section. And I'm just going to plot the moment on the tension side 
and my sign convention uh, that I have drawn here is that a positive moment is one which puts the top flange in compression. And so we have our uh, little happy beam. It's getting bent where the top flange is in compression. And this maximum moment equals PL over 4. Um, and that's going to be equal to 123 kilonewtons times 12 meters over 4. And that equals uh, 369 kilonewton meters. So M star... Our, our, our moment demand uh, equals 369 kilonewton meters. So, uh, essentially what we need to do is we need to determine a, uh, a section, um, so a UB section, which can uh, resist uh, this bending moment demand. That's, and that's what we're going to step through here. So, if we just go to another page, uh, we'll just start with our you know, reference column up here. And we'll do, um, you know, we'll say we'll determine section size. All right, so in order to determine the section size, it's always good if we start with the, essentially the governing equation uh, for our section property. So we have m star, so this is our demand, has to be less than or equal to phi m sub x. And um, all of this is coming from n sub s 3404 uh, in section 5.1. Dot one, and so um, you know if we if we sort of expand this out, that's equal to m star less than or equal to phi times um, f y uh, times z effective, and um, if you remember back to when we discussed uh, you know whether a section was compact or non-compact. Uh, it's really whether we can determine the full plastic moment. If a section was non-compact, we couldn't get the full plastic moment out of it, so we had a, a smaller capacity. So um, as a designer, we don't really want to choose those sections. We want to choose sections which are compact. And so if they're compact, you know, if section is compact, then z effective equals s of x. Uh, and remember, that's our plastic section modulus. Um, and so, you know, our, our plastic section modulus is larger than our elastic one, which means we have a greater section capacity. So that's what we want to pick. We want to pick a compact section. So um, let's go over to our, um, our UB tables here. And, uh, you know, keep in mind that with our uh, compact section, we, we can, when we're determining it, we've got one of two ways. Either, you know, we can look at our uh, design tables here. Uh, and this works for if we're just buying a standard hot rolled section. Uh, we can look at the compactness. And so if it, there's a C, uh, we know that it's compact. And if there's an N, we know it's non-compact. So all the Cs uh, will reach the effective section modulus. So if you see, uh, we'll just pull out an example. So this is our effective section modulus for bending about the x-axis for a 610 UB 125. Um, it's... Uh, 3,680 times 10 to the third millimeters to the third. Um, if we scroll back up, because that's a compact section, we can look, if we come over here, uh, that's the same as our plastic section modulus S of X over there. So, um, like I said, if we're, if we're just picking a table, uh, picking a section out of the table, uh, you know, we, we just use uh, that value. If, however, we have a uh, section which we are 
sort of uh, you know designing ourselves. You know, we have a built-up section. Uh, well, then we use the factors in table um, five dot two. And so we'll just do a quick search. And this is all based upon the slenderness limits um, of you know of each individual uh, piece. So whether that's the um, you know the flange or the web, and we we just step through each of those. But um, because we are uh, not going to do that, we're just going to look at um, our given um, uh, section sizes. All we need to do is uh, you know pick, assume that we're going to use a compact section, um, and then solve for what our effective section modulus needs to be here. So let's do that really quickly. Um, I'll just move this over here so that I don't run into. We'll just sort of separate that out with our calcs. It's just a little note um, here. So um, we'll have 369 kilonewton meters. Has to be less than or equal. So phi equals 0 0.9 uh, times Fy. Uh, let's assume uh, 300 MPa uh, for right now. And then Z effective, like I said, uh, we want a s of x required. So uh, let's rearrange this equation and find out sort of what size um, plastic section modulus we need uh, in order to resist this moment here. So uh, rearranging that, we'd have 369 kilonewton meters uh, times 1,000 uh, newtons per kilonewton times... 1,000 millimeters per meter over 0 0.9 times 300 megapascal. That all has to be less than or equal to Sx required. Uh, flipping these around and solving for this, we get Sx required has to be greater than or equal to 1,370 times 10 to the third millimeters to the third. All right, so we, we now know sort of the minimum size section that we need in order to resist um, this uh, bending moment demand. So the way that we find this is we just go back to our section tables. So with the section tables, um, Let's go up uh, one page here. Uh, really what we're looking for is um, an S of X, which is greater than 1,370, our, our requirement. So if we scroll down, well, we see there's a 1,200 and there's a 1,480. Uh, well, 1,200 is less than 1,370. So we have to, this is our smallest section size that we can use, which just happens to be a 460 UB by 67.1. So uh, let's, uh, let's use that section. Let's try that out. Um, so try a 460 UB 67.1. Um, and uh, well, you know, let's, we, we've, we've selected that. We know that the um, S of X equals 1,480, uh, sorry, times 10 to the third. Millimeters to the third. Uh, but remember, we, we selected this assuming that it was a compact section and assuming that the flange um, yield strength was uh, 300 MPa. So let's just go back and check and make sure that for a 460 UB uh, 67.1 uh, that those two assumptions are uh, you know still hold true. So um, if we you know go to the the next page in our steel table which just has whether uh, our compactness and the FY of the flange, uh, if we go to uh, 460 UB we see that it is indeed compact. Um, and like I said, we can either just look it up in this table or we can work that out uh, ourselves through the slenderness ratios and 
uh, table 5.2 in NZS 3404. And we look at the yield strength of the flange. It is uh, 300 MPA. If you remember that the um, for, for New Zealand and Australian steels, uh, the thinner the material, uh, the higher the um, uh, yield stress is. And so you can see uh, even here on the 460 UB, um, the flange is 300 MPA and the web is 320. Um, if we just go up to the previous page and we look at the thicknesses there, uh, that should make sense. So um, the thickness of the flange is over 11 millimeters, so it's going to be uh, uh, 300 MPA. Um, and the web thickness is less than 11 millimeters, so 320 MPA is the standard. Um, so coming back to our calculations here, uh, we, we also have, you know, a uh, compact section. And uh, we have the FY of the flange equals 300 MPA. All right, so uh, let's just see exactly what our section capacity is for this, uh, this member. Um, we, we know that it will be above our required, um, but let's just see sort of um, how big it is because we will need this M set, this uh, value um, M sub S uh, for when we do our moment capacity. So we should work it out. So we have M star is less than or equal to phi m of x, which equals phi fy s of x. So we get um, 369 less than or equal to 0 0.9 for our phi times 300 MPA times 1,480 times 10 to the third millimeters to the third, and we divide by 1,000 squared just to get our units correct. So we have 369. Uh, it does happen to be less than. Um, all of this works out to 400 kilonewton meters. And we say, you know, that's okay for section and we'll just write down ms of x equals 400 kilonewton meters all right so we we've determined our section capacity now um, the next thing we need to look at is what is our member capacity so remember that our member capacity is um, the, so our, if our section capacity is, is whether, you know, sort of what the, uh, the design moment can take, uh, can be applied um, before uh, local buckling, which occurs. Our member capacity is uh, sort of what moment can be applied um, prior to um, the element undergoing uh, lateral torsional buckling over a given a section. So, uh, so we determine our if we determine our section size, and then we go through and we check member bending capacity. And our member bending capacity is M star less than or equal to phi m sub b less than or equal to phi m sub s. So our, our, our bending capacity over the member um, can't, can never be greater than our section capacity. Our section capacity is our maximum. And like I said, um, we, we check this on a segment by segment uh, basis. And the segment is uh, simply uh, an element in between uh, points of lateral restraint. And so uh, with these points of lateral restraint, um, 
you know, it's uh, you know, how many segments do we have on this member? So here uh, we have uh, a restraint uh, at you know both ends and at the middle, and so our segment is actually going to be segment one and segment. Two, so it's just those are the points. The it's the member uh, between points of adjacent lateral restraint. So we we have that. Uh, so uh, these are the two segments that we need to check the bending capacity on. So let's just see. Uh, let's just sort of draw that up a little bit more graphically and look at what the uh, bending moment demand is over each of those segments. So if I'm drawing this out. And so I've got um, a bending moment diagram that looks like this, where we have um, 369 kilonewton meters. Um, and I have a segment, I essentially have, like we said, two segments, uh, six meters and six meters. Um, and let's just, you know, put some numbers at these restraints, one, two, and three. So the things that we, we know and then what we can use in order to um, sort of work out these elements are um, that we have two segments Um, you know, between, you know, one to two and two to three um, with length equal six meters. So each segment length is six meters long. Um, the... Um, and then let's see, well, you know, what are the restraint conditions... Uh, for both of these segments and restraints each segment so if we want to find the end restraints, well, it's really uh, based upon what do each of these, uh, so what does the restraint do for the critical flange? Remember the critical flange is the flange which is going to deflect uh, the largest during lateral torsional buckling. So for a beam, uh, which is simply supported, that's, that's just going to be the compression flange. So the, the tension flange won't, um, won't uh, deflect at all because it's inherently stable. It's that compression flange which wants to uh, sort of, you know, do that, you know, kick out uh, during lateral torsion buckling. So, um, it, and it's, it says that, you know, for each of these uh, restraints, uh, they, they stop both twist um, and lateral uh, um, movement, so lateral deflection. So let's just go uh, to our, uh, to NZS 3404, and just look at what our restraint conditions are. Uh, would look like. So we have a, a couple of options. So we have either this um, full section restraint. Um, and so this full section restraint is, um, you know, restrains lateral deflection of the critical flange and provides effective restraint against twist. So that really looks like what we have. Um, we have a, a partial restraint. Um, which a partial restraint, uh, you know, it, it prevents lateral deflection, um, but it, it does it at some point other than the critical flange, and it provides partial restraint uh, against twist. Um, and so, uh, well, you know, it's partial restraint. So, you know, or, uh, we'll figure out if that's what that is. And then, um, oh, here we go. Here's some, some you know, some nice little diagrams which they give us. So with a, um, um, you know, with a, a full restraint, 
So say the top is the critical flange. Um, we're going to stop it. So if you look at the sort of diagram which they have here, so this would be the top or the bottom. Um, the the section cannot rotate, and uh, the element uh, can't move side to side. <clears throat> so this is essentially what we have. Uh, just to go through for um, completeness, uh, you know, if we have, um, you know, the the critical flange is on the top. Uh, so this won't move it side to side, but because our, our restraint is a little bit flexible, um, you know, it's not a full um, uh, restraint. So for, here we go, so for some, um, these are all fully restrained sections, uh, so for some partial restraints, um, we would have, uh, say, this is a classic one where uh, we have um, bolted in the bottom flange, so it can't move. Uh, but then it's only the bending capacity of the web uh, which is providing twist restraint. So um, we have uh, essentially uh, this from the um, uh, from the brief. So the end restraints for for each segment uh, are going to both be what we call FF. So uh, full restraint. At both segment ends. Um, uh, what else do we know about this? Well, we also know that for for a given segment, you know, say a segment one to two, um, we have a linear. change in moment demand and um, both segments are symmetric. So, you know, if both segments are symmetric, it means that we really only need to design for one of them because it's going to be the exact same capacity but just mirrored. Um, and then this linear change in moment demand uh, will be important for uh, working out our, um, our capacity M sub B. So we'll go back to our, uh, our reference here. Um, and this is our... member, uh, we'll say bending capacity, continued, just give our calculations some titles here. Um, so again, we'll just sort of, you know, write our governing equation up at the top, phi m sub b less than or equal to, you know, phi m sub s, and, and all of this is coming from n sub s, 3404, 5.1.1. So what is this, you know, we, we know m sub s, we've already figured this out, we know our phi is 0 0.9. What is m sub b equal? Well, m sub b equals alpha m times alpha s times m sub s. So we know m sub s, that's the same as, that's just our section capacity. Um, so alpha m is going to be uh, a determination for, you know, how we change our capacity based upon the uh, applied moment, um, which is there. Um, so sort of what the pattern of that um, uh, moment application looks like, whether it's uh, because you know we've we've derived all of our critical buckling moments uh, based upon a, um, uh, a uniform moment distribution, um, and so if we have a uh, anything which looks different, well we we can use a, a different moment capacity, and then this alpha s is is going to be you know essentially the ratio between 
how close our suction capacity is uh, to our uh, critical buckling moment for a given segment length and end condition. So we'll work out this alpha M first. So alpha M, um, you know, if we look back at what our, um, you know, moment, uh, you know, distribution is, it's going to be a linear distribution. And so um, where we find all of our alpha M is going to come, uh, factors, uh, is really going to come from table 5.6.1. So we'll, uh, we'll go back to that. So this is in uh, table uh, 5.6.1 you can see these alpha M factors and it, it's really based upon, you know, what are different, um, you know, load, uh, our, our, our moment distribution patterns are. So you can see uh, the value of one uh, is really how our critical buckling moment was derived. And this is just a, a uniform, um, you know, constant moment across the segment length. So what do we have? We have one where there's a linear distribution where we have uh, a moment of one size at one end, and then we have a moment, some ratio of that on the other. Um, and we can see that this beta M factor, it goes between negative one, so it's the you know, same moment, but just in the opposite direction to 0 0.6. Um, but you know that can also equal zero, so that we just have this uh, linear distribution. So that's what we're, we're gonna look at. So for where beta M equals zero, so just this uh, linear response here, uh, and this will be our equation. So uh, we'll write that down. So for a linear um, moment distribution, So again, we'll just we'll draw the the little picture in our calcs where at one end is m, one end is beta m times m, and beta m equals zero. So we get alpha m equals one point seven five plus one point zero five times beta m plus 0 0.3 times beta m squared. Uh, because beta m equals 0, these two cancel out. So we get 1.75 plus 0 plus 0. So alpha m equals 1.75. And then this is just coming straight out of this table. It's simply based upon the, uh, the load pattern. All right, so well now we have um, alpha m, uh, we have m sub s, we have phi. The only thing we need to find is this alpha s factor. Um, and as I said, this alpha s factor is really the, um, you know, uh, a ratio of how close um, your, uh, your section capacity is to the critical buckling um, moment. So and like, let's just write that down, you know, um, close the section capacity is to critical buckling moment, that's MOA, remember section capacity, that's M sub X, uh, for the segment. So alpha S, um, if we look up what that is, it equals 0 0.6, times uh, the section capacity divided by the critical buckling moment, all of that squared, 
plus 3. Um, this, th this expression all taken to the power of 1 half, so square root, minus the ratio of the section capacity over the critical buckling load. So both of these expressions times 0 0.6. So what is our critical buckling? And, and this is coming from uh, section 5.6.1.1.1c. So what is MOA equal? This is our critical buckling moment. And it equals um, pi squared times E times IY over LE squared minus g times j plus pi squared times e times i sub w over le squared and that whole thing we take the square root and this is from 5.6.1.1.1d so, you know, what do we already know from our uh, section uh, geometry? Well, you know, if we look at our, our so we, we know our section capacity, m sub x. Uh, we've already worked that out. Um, we also, you know, if we go through our critical buckling moment equation, well, you know, pi is, is a constant. E is just the Young's modulus of the material. G is just the shear modulus of the material. Um, I sub y is the um, moment of inertia about the weak axis, so the, the out-of-plane uh, direction in this case. Uh, J is just the torsional constant. That's just a, um, uh, a, a, a section uh, property. Um, I sub w is just the warping constant. Again, just a section property. And then we have L sub e, which is the effective length um, of the section, of the segment, sorry. Um, and this will just be dependent upon you know, load height and um, our, our end restraints. So let's just write down what we what we do know. You know, for a 460 UB 67.1, um, we you know I sub y j and I sub W, so we can find all of those just from our section properties table. So from our 460UB 67.1, um, if we come across here, uh, we see we've got I sub Y, we have J, we have I sub W, so we can just write down what those values are, and then I'll, I'll just do that here. So I sub Y equals 14.5 times 10 to the 6th millimeters to the 4th. J equals 378 times 10 to the 3rd millimeters to the 3rd. I sub W equals 708 times 10 to the 9th millimeters to the sixth. So E equals uh, 200,000 MPA. That's just Young's modulus of steel. And G, which is our shear modulus, equals 80,000 MPA. So uh, just to remind you the relationship between Young's modulus and the shear modulus is E equals 2 times G times 1 plus uh, Poisson's ratio. And so if we rearrange that, we get G equals um, E over 2 times 1 plus Poisson's. Uh, and that's just 200,000 over 2 times 1 plus uh, Poisson's ratio for steel is 0 0.25. So that's how we work all of that out. 
Um, so the, this gives us, you know, almost everything we need to work out what our critical buckling moment is. The only thing that we need in addition to that is what our effective length is. So uh, LE is just uh, case of T uh, times case of L times case of R uh, times L. Um, and that's just coming from 5.6.3.1. And so these are just, so L is, uh, we know L, L equals 6 meters. Uh, that's just the segment length. Um, you know, that's just the segment length here, you know, segment 1, 6 meters. And then all of these other factors um, will just either increase or decrease that uh, effective length based upon the end conditions. So, uh, come back to a new page here. So, we'll we start our ref. Um, capacity continued. And, and the reason that I, I put these uh, these little titles up here is when, when you come through your um, uh, your your calculations, or so, so if someone else comes through your calculations, or you come through your calculations um, a number of you know days, weeks, months later, you you need uh, sort of a roadmap in order to get you um, where you uh, where you need to be. Um, and make sure that you've got the, um, the correct, uh, you, know, you know what your calculations are. So, um, as I said, you know, the only things that we still need to determine in order to determine this are these uh, K factors here uh, to get our effective length. So let's start with um, case of T. Uh, and this is our uh, twist restraint factor. Um, and the, that's just simply coming from um, table 5.6.31, as NZS 3404. So let's look up, um, you know, what that table looks like. Um, so within this table, uh, we see, you know, oh, sorry, this is our... It's the wrong uh, end restraint. We haven't quite got there yet. All right, here we go. For the uh, twist restraint factor, um, as you can see from the table, it's based upon what our end restraint conditions are, so for each end. Um, so because uh, we have uh, two full restraints, um, you know, we have the condition of FF, so our KT factor equals 1.0. Um, you can also see that if we had, you know, two partial restraints, our KT factor equals this, um, and uh, and that's so. It's simply just a uh, determine your your end uh, restraint condition uh, at each end of your segment, and then your KT factor sort of uh, just comes right out of that. So um, restraint equal F F. So KT equals 1.0. So that was our, our first uh, factor that we, we needed to find. So we had, um, you know, case of T. Well, now we need to find case of L. Um, so case of L is our load height factor. And um, if we look uh, that one up, it is um, in table 5.6.3, uh, number two. So let's just have a look at that um, from our equations of 5.6.1. This was our uh, load height. So we come here, so this is our load height factor, and it's uh, really dependent on a, on a few things. Um, so it's whether, you know, the load height position, whether it's um, at the shear center uh, or, or above it, 
um, what the end restraint conditions are uh, for your, your given um, segment. And um, finally, whether you are within the segment or um, at some location uh, at, you know, or at the end of it. So, uh, well, we know that from our, our KT factor and our, our end restraints are F and F. Um, so, you know, we're, it's, you know, we, we see that we, we've got, we're going to be on this top row for either, you know, wherever our, our load is uh, requ uh, occurring. Um, if we go back to our project brief, we can see that uh, the load supplied uh, right at the end of the segment, so right where there's a restraint. Um, and what's more is it's applied at the top flange. So if we go back to our table, uh, so uh, we are at the end of a segment and we're applied at the top flange. So we have a load height factor of 1.0. So if we had all of the same um, uh, conditions, uh, except for say that load was uh, you know, applied within the segment, well, we would have to increase our effective length by 1.4, uh, effectively decreasing our, um, our design um, bending member capacity. We don't have to do that, so we can just say it's end of the segment, so our load height, uh, case of L, equals uh, 1.0. So, um, case of L, so we've got restraints. equal F F um, load at segment end and um, load to top flange um, therefore case of L equals 1.0 so that's just what we looked up in that table so you know just as a reminder here we are segment end top flange full restraint full restraint 1.0 um, our final one is case of R. Um, this is our end restraint factor. Um, and it too is uh, just, uh, we look this up in a table and it happens to be table 5.6.3 sub 3. So let's just have a quick look at that. Um, so it's, you know, immediately down here. Um, so uh, this is the only one which actually reduces our capacity. Um, and uh, the big thing is, is the, you know, ends with minor axis rotation restraints. So if, well, let's come up here uh, in the uh, code provisions. Um, uh, I think we have it sitting down here somewhere. Um, I apologize. I'm not going to find it quick enough, so uh, we won't um, we won't worry too much about it. Uh, but the the big thing is that for it is conservative to take this factor as one. So the reason is is it's um, essentially say that you know this uh, eraser is our beam, and we're bending it you know about the strong axis. So if we look in plan, what the KR factor is saying that it's stopping any twist um, in this direction, uh, and it's sort of in the the um, you know about the the vertical plane, it's stopping that sort of twist. Um, our end restraints are stopping you know it this twist uh, about the about the the axis this way, um, and this is twist around here. It's really, really hard in practice to get any restraint out of there, uh, and it's about it. And you can't do it with a simply supported member. About the only time that this uh, end restraint will be something other than one is if you have really stiff, uh, so you have a continuous beam with really stiff side spans, or you have the end 
uh, sort of anchored into concrete. So we will just use KR equals 1.0, um, and that's uh, a nice conservative um, uh, metric, and you can see that, um, you know, this is the only factor which reduces our effective length, and so by uh, taking it as one, we're, we're nice and conservative. All right, well, now we have um, kind of everything that we need. Um, so let's, uh, let's determine what our effective length is, and then we can plug in all of our section properties into our uh, critical buckling moment, and then find our alpha s and find out if we have enough uh, member capacity uh, for this section. So le equals 1.0 times 1.0 times 1.0 times 6 meters, LE equals 6 meters. All right, so um, plugging in everything for MOA. Uh, and just a reminder, this is going to be pi squared times EIY over LE squared plus G times J pi squared E I sub W over L E squared. That whole thing, we take the square root. Um, so let's plug in our values. So uh, that's going to be equal to pi times 200,000 MPA times 14.5 times 10 to the 6th for i sub y pi squared divided by uh, we need to make sure we keep our units correct so it's 6,000 millimeters Um, and then we multiply that by 80,000 times our torsional constant, which is 378 times 10 to the third millimeters to the third uh, plus pi squared times 200,000 times 708 times 10 to the 9th over 6,000 squared. And we're going to take the square root of all of that. And all of that works out to... MOA equals 2,000, no, sorry, 234 kilonewton meters. And I've, I've divided by 1,000 squared just to get everything into the, uh, the correct units. So now, um, now that we have MOA, we can work out what our alpha S equals. So that's 0 0.6. times m of s over MOA, all of that squared, plus 3 square root minus m of x over MOA. Let's plug in um, what all of these equations are. So remember m of x. equals 400 kilonewtons divided by 0 0.9 equals 444 kilonewton meters. So we had 400 kilonewtons was our section capacity. Obviously, that's multiplied by a load reduction factor. 
because we're looking at just m's of x, not phi m's of x, uh, we need to get this into the uh, correct, um, uh, basically we need to take out this load reduction factor uh, to look at this ratio. So alpha s equals 444 over 234, that value squared, plus 3, minus 444 over 234, all times 0 0.6. So I've just moved the 0 0.6 over to this side because I ran out of room. So we end up, if we work all of that out, we get an alpha s equal to 0 0.40. All right, well, let's see uh, what our capacity is. Uh, so we'll come back to our ref. So um, plugging all of this back in, we get, um, you know, uh, m sub b equals alpha m times alpha s times m s of x. So m sub b equals uh, 1.75 for alpha m, that was what we worked out, um, times 0 0.4 for alpha s is what we just worked out, times 444 kilonewton meters. Um, we work all that out, we get m sub b equals 311 kilonewton meters. So m star has to be less than or equal to phi M sub B, so 369, where's that set, you know, compared to 0 0.9 times 3, 11, well, 369, oop, sorry, 369 kilonewton meters is greater than, uh, if you work this out, that equals 280 kilonewton meters. No good. So this means that while our section capacity was large enough for the segment length that we had, the critical buckling moment was just too high. Even though we had this 1.75 times uh, factor, um, well then, you know, we, we just, we couldn't make it work. Uh, so um, what we need to do is we need to bump up our section size. So... Uh, let's try um, let's try another section up. Um, so if we come back here, we we tried us uh, 460 UB, and um, if we just go back to our calculations, you can see we're we're quite far out here. You know, we we've got uh, about 90 kilonewton meters that we need to uh, you know try to uh, sort of boost up. So we we need a significantly larger section. Um, in order to uh, contend with this. So um, let's try actually uh, the next, so not, not the next size up, not, not a, a f, you know, UB460. Let's try this um, UB460 uh, 82.1. Um, if we look down here, 460 UB 82.1, uh, it's a compact section, uh, FY equals uh, 300 MPA. So um, if we, uh, sorry, yeah, equals 300, uh, MPA. So, um, there we go, uh, right here. So, um, let's try that. So we go try, UB 82.1, um, Oh, sorry, try 460 UB. Uh, 
82.1. So we that has a S of X equal to 1840 times 10 to the third millimeters to the third Fy of the flange equals 300 MPA and it is a compact section. So uh, working all of this out we have MS of X equals 300 well sorry MS of X is just going to be FY times S of X uh, which equals 300 megapascals times 1840 times 10 to the third millimeters to the third and we'll divide out by a thousand squared in order to get into kilonewton meters instead of uh, newton millimeters and we have m s of x equals 552 kilonewton meters all right so now what we need to do we need to recheck our um, our member capacity but you know if we look here the only thing so what hasn't changed our alpha m hasn't changed because we still have the same pattern on our demand we now have worked out our new ms of x uh, so the only thing we need to recheck is alpha s and it's it's really it's that ratio between the section uh, capacity and the critical buckling moment so recheck alpha s so for a 460 ub 82.1 um, e still equals 200 thousand megapascal G still equals 80,000 megapascal the um, the out of plane bending uh, or moment of inertia is uh, one point uh, so 18.6 times 10 to the sixth millimeters to the fourth the torsional constant J equals 701 times 10 to the third millimeters to the fourth sorry and I sub W the warping constant equals 919 times 10 to the ninth millimeters to the sixth um, the other thing is that our um, our effective length hasn't changed either. So if we go back to you know our effective length equation, um, our twist factor is still the same because our restraints haven't changed. Uh, the load still being applied from the top, and we still have uh, we we're not going to count on our end restraint, and the segment length hasn't changed. So we can go back through and plug in uh, for our uh, critical buckling moment. The only thing we need to change is the section properties. So that's what we'll do now. So MOA equals pi squared E I sub Y over LE squared times G times J plus pi squared E I sub W over L E squared, all of that taken to the square root. Uh, that's equal to, we can, this is just sort of a plug and chug operation now. P 
pi squared times 200 thousand times 18.6 times 10 to the 6. Like I said, the um, effective length is still the same. That's still 6,000 uh, millimeters. Uh, that's all squared. Um, that's multiplied by 80,000 um, times 701 times 10 to the third. Um, and then we sort of will add in uh, that uh, warping constant uh, pi squared times 200,000 times 919 times 10 to the ninth over 6,000 squared. You take the square root of all of that. And if we work all of this out and we simplify it down, and we simplify it down, we get MOA equals 329 kilonewton meters. All right, well now we have M's of S, we have MOA, we can um, check uh, alpha S. So uh, if we put in our alpha s, um, that's going to, again, equal 0 0.6 times the square root of m of x over moa squared plus 3 minus m of x over moa. Um, plugging in our um, uh, our, our section pro our, our section capacities and our uh, critical buckling moment, we get 0 0.6 times uh, 552 divided by 329. Uh, we square that plus three minus 552 over 329. Um, and all of that simplifies down to a alpha s equal 0 0.44. So even though we've gone with a much, much bigger section, um, we actually don't have that much more uh, capacity out of here. So we went from a 0 0.4 to a 0 0.44. So, um, but uh, we, we're still the similar ratio between our section modulus and uh, between our, you know, for section modulus ratio to its um, critical buckling moment. But what's going to save us is this M's of X has gotten much, much bigger as we've gone to this larger section. So uh, M's of B uh, equals alpha m, alpha s, ms of x, uh, that equals 1.75 times 0 0.44 times 552 kilonewton meters. So m sub b equals 425 kilonewton meters. So we need to check and make sure that M star is it less than or equal to phi M sub B. So 369, 0 0.9 times 425. So, 369 kilonewton 
meters is indeed less than 383 kilonewton meters. Okay for Okay for bending. So use a 460 UB 82.1. So with our calculations, if we're going to determine a section size, we always want to be explicit here at the end. So, I mean, that's... Um, that, that, that's it. That's uh, determining the section capacity. Well, so determining the bending uh, and designing, uh, you know, for the bending demand uh, for a, um, a particular um, section. So what we do um, is we, you know, for, for a given start, just, to, just as a quick recap, uh, what we do is we work out, uh, you know, what our demands are. So we, we uh, look at our load combinations. Uh, we look at what our bending moment uh, diagram is uh, because we're going to need that for our uh, our load pattern. Uh, then we determine a section capacity, so because we we need to have a section capacity greater uh, than what our demand is. Uh, then we take that section capacity and we work out, uh, you know, for a given, um, you know, what. We, we need to see well, for a given uh, load pattern, so our alpha M, so in this case, uh, this is over our given segment. We have a nice linear uh, bit. Um, what our uh, you know alpha S is going to be, and this alpha S is just a ratio between our section capacity and our critical buckling moment uh, here, and from this critical buckling moment, and remember, we, all, we always do this segment by segment um, for the beam. So um, that's going to wrap up uh, this um, sort of example. I hope you found that uh, helpful uh, in sort of clarifying uh, some of the previous lectures in um, how we determined the, uh, both the section capacity for member and bending as well as the member capacity uh, for a given segment subjected to a particular load. So there's a, it's a lot of uh, you know, equations, but it's, it's not an... The, the, the process isn't terribly difficult. Uh, the big thing is to remember we do this segment by segment, and so we want to find out what our critical flange is, what the restraints are, and what the um, you know sort of particular demand pattern is on that. So with that, we will wrap up um, this, uh, this recording here. Thank you very much.